Thank you, Barb. Um, this story is essentially the first chapter in my father's biography that I am working on. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He's 91 years old. But that's not why he's not here. He actually had a prior family engagement in San Francisco. So I hope he's having a good time there. There's not enough time to read the whole story, but I thought I would read some excerpts for you. It's written in the first person. My education as a communist. The communists thought that we were too wealthy. They called us kulaks. When I was a small child, all property was confiscated and taken into collective ownership. There was no more importing, no more freedom. Churches were turned into granaries, and any expression of faith was forbidden. But we would continue secretly. My mother lulled me to sleep at night, softly singing her songs of faith while playing her guitar. We had to leave everything behind. We moved to Zagrodovka, another Mennonite settlement in Ukraine, where my grandparents lived. While we stayed with them, my father built our little house in a nearby village. The house was very primitive. It had a dirt floor and a straw roof. There was a bedroom, but most of us slept in the front living room. Our bedding was about a foot of straw covered by cloth and a pillow. Our wooden bed frames and other furniture had to be left behind. By 1930, there were four boys and two young girls in our family. I was fourth. In the kitchen, we sat on two benches made from wood planks at a handmade table. There was a big brick stove that the men had made. We used the stove for cooking and to heat the house. It was fueled by straw and dried manure. The stove was vented through a chimney that went through the attic. A layer of straw in the attic provided some insulation for the cold winters. Steps led up to the attic where we could find our forbidden Bible in a secret place. As part of our communist indoctrination, all <coughs> young children took part in the pioneers. In our teens, we graduated to the Komsomol. Adults were expected to finally join the communist party. We were educated by state institutions. We were taught that allegiance to the state was more important than family. They showed us a film where a child shot her parents because they were enemies of the state. Many men in our villages were then branded enemies of the state torture and sentenced to work in slave camps in Siberia, including my, uh, my father's father. Three informers in our village reported on others for their supposed crimes and received 45 or 50 rubles for each report, which was a lot of money at that time. When I was about six years old, I was selected as the village's first October child. Sporting a big red star on my chest, I was tasked with reciting a communist poem in the Russian language. I had memorized the poem, but when I stood up and saw the faces of everyone in this cool auditorium, all I could remember was the title. <laughs> this is me. Et o ya. I said it three times, then sat down. <laughs> I heard laughter, and when I fell asleep during the long program, someone carried me off the stage. <laughs> the school was right across the street from our house. When I was a teenager, we were very poor and I had no shoes, just sandals. In the winter, I would carry my socks and sandals and run barefoot through the snow to school. My feet would be red, but after I wiped the snow off, I was dry for the school day. I was determined to learn. Most of our world history lessons were about Russia, but I liked to hear about other countries, and I liked our teacher, Mr. Mr. Brushnievsky. I got good grades, but there were two girls who were seemingly smarter than me. During the farming season, we all had to work on the collective farms. When I was nine years old, I worked 10 hour days, six days a week. I learned how to ride a horse, bareback, dragging a cultivator behind me. It was a steel apparatus that lifted the soil and fluffed it up. My father would walk behind me, holding its handles to keep it straight. We got so tired we would sing to stay awake. 
once I fell asleep while riding. My horse had gone into the next row, and my father was not too happy. There were still a few tractors in the village, but not enough to work all the land. At harvest time, the whole village took part. We had hundreds of pounds of corn and removed all the seeds by hand with a piece of steel. Our hands were pretty sore at the end of the day. Sunflower seeds were also removed by hand. Sunflowers were very popular and we had big fields of them. Some evenings we would get together with a few young, other young people and roast the seeds in our big oven and eat them. Although we worked hard and had very little, we didn't feel deprived. We looked forward to lunch every day. A woman would bring a hot meal out to the fields, soup, potatoes, or corn on the cob when it was in season. And we always looked forward to Sundays. It was against our beliefs to work on Sundays, and the governing communists seemed to accept that. Then we would play games with homemade toys. We made our own skates with a piece of steel. After the heavy spring rains, the fields would freeze over and become ice rinks. I skated all the way to my grandfather, five kilometers away, in the next village. We would play our own version of hockey. We found sticks in the bush and used them to maneuver a handmade puck. Sugar came in big chunks, and we would cut a piece and wrap it in cloth for the puck. There was no physical contact or fighting, but we would call out to the opposing team, now we're coming to attack you. <laughs> A lot of people made their own guns. When I was seven or eight years old, my brother Henry and I played with a pistol my brother Isaac had made. The communists taught us in school, Moscow is mine. All the country is mine. Everything is mine. So the young people figured, the tractors that are just sitting in the shed over winter, they're mine. <laughs> we would cut pieces of pipe from the tractors to make guns. And that's how Isaac made this pistol. It was tricky getting the tractors to start again in this <laughs> As my father had a shotgun to hunt rabbits and other animals, gunpowder was bought and stored away. But we knew where it was hidden. We went up there and got it down. It was mine too. You be the rabbit and I'll be the hunter, Henry said. He was only two years older than me. It was just a game. Henry loaded the pistol with gunpowder and lead and chased me around the house trying to kill me. Jeez. He applied fire to the gun, and it should have exploded, but nothing happened. I'll warm it up with a match, and then it will fire, he said. I held the gun as he was warming it, but the barrel was pointed toward his body. <laughs> Suddenly, it fired and hit him. Two pieces of lead were in that gun, and they went into his chest. Henry dropped to the floor and began bleeding. He ordered, go and get the teacher. And get rid of the gun. <laughs> After throwing the gun into the well, I ran across the street to Mr. Brzezniewski and shouted, My brother is bleeding. He ran over and summoned Dr. Johannes Klein. Dr. Klein cut my brother open right there and took the lead out from where it had lodged close to his heart. He operated without anesthesia. It was a miracle that Henry survived. He healed pretty quickly. Dr. Klein was an excellent physician. He had been transferred to our village from Odessa in southern Ukraine. After the German army moved in and we were allowed to have church services, Dr. Klein became one of our church leaders. Maybe there was more to that miracle. It wasn't the last time that an invisible shield came between me and gunfire. Even in the worst of our hardship, when my father died young from torture he endured, when all of Ukraine was forced to starve in 1932 to 33, when our little house burnt down and we had nothing but the table carried out with our dinner frozen upon it. Through it all, my mother's faith remained strong. I can still hear her playing her guitar and singing forbidden songs of faith, lulling me to sleep at night. And I have felt her prayers shielding me from death again and again. But my education as a communist was laid to rest long ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.